the WNBA is destroying itself. Under the table payment offers to current players. They were fined for chartering flights to road games. You need to be paid. If you're telling us this is a problem, you're not making a profit, how are you getting us to that point? It's the most competitive league in the world. The pay gap, you know, we could just take a donation around the NBA, maybe. And in a league that's fought for decades for attention in a sport dominated by men, they've had to sacrifice growth for equality. But I'm not talking about equality with the NBA. That's really not the issue here. In fact, simply paying WNBA players NBA salaries still wouldn't solve their biggest problem. That problem could actually be fixed tomorrow with one simple rule change. So why is the WNBA so afraid to make it? Well, first we have to understand that the WNBA isn't just making up the rules as they go. They've actually studied the trajectory of another failing basketball league to create a blueprint for the growth of theirs. You see, in 1950, there was a little known, relatively unpopular professional American basketball league that was struggling to stay in business. It was called the National Basketball Association. And at the time of its creation, the sport of basketball was barely a top 10 sport here in America. Teams averaged fewer than 5,000 fans per game, and of the 23 original franchises, 15 ended up going out of business, with six of the remaining eight teams eventually moving to a new city. Fast forward to the 1970s, the league's third decade, and things still weren't much better. Attendance had only risen to an average of 8,000 fans per game, and games weren't even being broadcast nationally. And even when they were, they were often on tape delay, including the finals. Now, during this time, it was unclear if the NBA would even last past year 30. Its revenues were an abysmal $32.2 million per year, which is just $244 million in today's money, and less than the revenue of even the poorest NBA franchises today. So what changed? How did the NBA, a league struggling for relevance in its third decade, become one of America's most popular sports? Well, a few things happened in the 1970s that set it on a trajectory to become the behemoth it is today. For starters, there was a slow change in attitude across the country that led to a greater acceptance of the sport of basketball. You see, for most of the game's existence, basketball, specifically the NBA, was seen as a quote, black man's game. And in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, that was a turnoff for a still segregated America. The league was viewed as violent and not family friendly, which contributed to low attendance numbers and a lack of interest for households to watch the sport on TV. But that all changed in 1984, the 38th year of the NBA, when a former lawyer by the name of David Stern became the commissioner. Now, Stern was no stranger to the league, as he had been with the NBA since 1978 during which he helped implement a drug testing policy that attempted to address the stigma that the NBA had a drug problem. Since at the time, it was reported that up to 75% of NBA players used cocaine. But maybe Stern's most defining impact on the game of basketball was his pivot to market the stars instead of the teams. This meant getting generational talents and rivalries like Bird Magic and Jordan and Isaiah on national TV as much as possible. It also meant finally allowing NBA players to compete in the Olympics, which spawned the birth of the 1992 Dream Team and helped explode the popularity and profile of the NBA around the world. And now, the NBA earns $10 billion in revenue every single year, a 4,000% increase in just a few decades. But why even bring all of this up? Isn't this video supposed to be about the WNBA and not the NBA? I mean, we already know how successful the NBA has become, but what does any of this have to do with the women's side of the sport? Well, consider this. Before the NBA's 30th year in 1976, its games weren't being consistently broadcast on national television, not even the finals, teams averaged fewer than 8,000 fans per game, and the league made less than $250 million in today's money. Sound familiar? It's nearly the exact same situation the WNBA is in today in its 26th year. But there's still one crucial obstacle that might prevent the women's league from ever succeeding itself. You see, the WNBA wasn't formed the same way the NBA was in 1946. In fact, it was a rather intentional effort by David Stern and a league executive Val Ackerman to grow the women's side of the game here in America. And to do that, they attempted to copy the same playbook that had worked for the NBA less than 10 years prior, by growing the game through the Olympics. You see, the 1996 Olympics were set to be held in Atlanta, which Stern and Ackerman saw as a great way to test the waters for a potential professional women's basketball league here in America. That's because up until that point, there hadn't been a professional women's league here in the States. 
Now, in other parts of the world, women could go earn up to $200,000 playing professionally in places like Russia, China, Turkey, and Europe, which many did after college. But in order to adequately test the prospects of a professional league in America, Stern and Ackerman needed those players to stay in America during the 10 months leading up to the 96 Olympics. That's so they could play in 52 exhibition games together across the US and five different countries in a program that traveled a total of 100,000 miles and cost USA Basketball $3 million. Now, the initial promise to these players wasn't great. Many would be taking a pay cut to stay here in America as the program only offered each player $50,000. But the much larger promise was that this exhibition series could help plant the seeds for a potential NBA-backed women's league in America. And, well, it worked. The USA women's team went 52-0 in their exhibition games, and then went 8-0 in the Olympics in Atlanta to secure a gold medal. But even more importantly, the team drew a record of 202,556 fans across their eight Olympic games, good enough for an average of 25,320 fans per game. And this was a strong enough data point for Stern and Ackerman to go all all in on a women's basketball league the following year. And in 1997, the WNBA was born, with Val Ackerman selected as its first commissioner. But in its first 10 seasons, the league was an abject failure. Five of the eight original teams folded or moved cities, and the teams that did stick around were estimated to be losing upwards of $2 million every single year. It got so bad, in fact, that the league lost an estimated $400 million in its first 13 seasons. Now, luckily for them, they had the financial backstop of the NBA, which floated the league an estimated $10 million per year just to keep it in business. And it was this financial backing, as well as an increased interest in women's sports, that led teams to start finding their footing. And by December 2010, the league reported its first ever profitable team. By 2011, three teams reported positive earnings, and six teams were profitable by 2013. 13. That's half the teams in the WNBA making money less than 20 years after the league started. And by 2019, year 22, the WNBA reported $100 million in revenue, which was double what it made just five years prior. Not to mention that in 2023, attendance is up 24%, the biggest growth among any professional sports league in America, and nationally televised games have also seen a 67% increase in viewership over the last year, now averaging 556,000 viewers per game, which puts this year on track to be the most watched WNBA season in 20 years. This is thanks in large part to the distribution the league has seen through ESPN on TV, as well as their social channels and through pages of brands like Bleacher Report. Distribution, which also comes with a massive revenue upside. In this case, ESPN will pay the WNBA $33 million per year through 2025 to broadcast its games. It's also worth mentioning that women's basketball even has an exciting collegiate scene, which was highlighted by a record 9.9 .9 million viewers who tuned in to watch the exciting LSU versus Iowa showdown during last year's March Madness. But still, something's not clicking. I mean, the WNBA followed the exact same playbook the NBA did before its 30th year. The perception of the league has improved as its teams have found a more solid financial footing, they have distribution through one of the largest sports networks on television, and there's more public support for women's sports than there ever has been before. So why does it still seem like there's a problem with the WNBA, especially among its players who are being paid more than they ever have been before? Well, the answer is actually a lot more simple than you might think. Remember all the excitement earlier this year around players like Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark? Well, that excitement will likely be short-lived because there's a chance Angel Reese or even Caitlin Clark won't make it to the WNBA, even if they're drafted in the first round. Now, don't get me wrong. It isn't because either girl isn't good enough. I mean, just this year, the 2020 WNBA Rookie of the Year was waived by the Minnesota Lynx, as were both of the team's draft picks from last year and their 2021 19th overall pick. In fact, of the 12 players drafted in the first round, round of the 2021 WNBA draft, only five averaged more than 10 minutes per game. That meant that in 2021, the Rookie of the Year won the award, averaging just 8.6 points per game. And of the 36 players drafted that year, only 19 ever even played a game in the WNBA. So the problem clearly isn't with the players or the talent, it's with the league. But what exactly is the problem? Well, New York Liberty star Brianna Stewart summarized the issue pretty well in a series of tweets last year. She basically said that the fact that there's a hard salary cap in the WNBA puts teams in a really tough spot, specifically when it comes to young players. She goes on to say that teams' inability to keep young players on the roster means that the WNBA can never build off the momentum created at the college level, and that the league needs to make a change to capitalize on the momentum it has at the moment. But what is that change? 
Well, some players and fans argue it's to create a sort of developmental league, like the G League, to help create more opportunities for young players. But the WNBA's commissioner has come out this year saying that she doesn't think the league's financial model is solid enough to support a developmental league. And that's totally fair. I mean, the NBA's G League reportedly isn't even profitable. Another solution that's been floated around is expanding the WNBA. And honestly, this isn't a terrible idea, since there are dozens of cities that seem excited and able to host a women's basketball team that just don't have one yet. But even this doesn't solve our issue. It just places a band-aid over it until the drafts inevitably expand or the college game continues to grow and we're right back to where we started. Too many good players and not enough roster spots. No, if the WNBA wants to actually solve the problem, it has to address the one staring it right in the face. And that's the fact that most teams aren't even filling up the roster spots they currently have. In fact, most teams only roster 11 players, leaving an entire spot open on their bench. Imagine an NBA or NFL team doing that. And this is the problem we're actually trying to solve, but the WNBA is making it harder on itself to do so. As was highlighted in the league's most recent CBA in which players' salaries went up almost twice as much as the salary cap did. In other words, the league sacrificed positive short-term headlines for future growth. To give you a better idea of what I mean, consider this. Under the new CBA that started in 2020, the WNBA's new minimum salary was $57,000 for players with less than three years of experience and $68,000 for everyone else. But the real flashy numbers were seen at the top with the league's supermax now reaching $215,000, an increase of 94% from 2019 when the maximum player salary was just $117,500. There's just one problem. While player salaries increased upwards of 94%, the salary cap increased less than 40%, from $996,000 per team to just $1.3 And in a league with a hard cap like the NFL or the WNBA, this means that owners can't spend more than their allotted $1.3 million. So while player costs just went up twofold, a team's budget to pay those players hardly increased at all, which led to the logical conclusion that Brianna Stewart explained in her tweet. Teams struggle to retain their talented young rookies. That's in part because unlike the NFL or NBA, if a team can't afford to sign a player but wants to keep them around, they can't stash them on their practice squad or in the G League because in the WNBA, no such thing exists. Not to mention there are only 12 teams in the league, with hundreds of college players becoming draft eligible every single year. That's caused over 40% of players who get drafted to the WNBA to never even make a roster in the league. So there's an influx in the supply of talented young players, but an artificially suppressed demand. So what does the league do? Well, I think it's time to look past the NBA for solutions on how to solve the WNBA's biggest problem. I mean, the blueprint has gotten them this far, but it's almost like the league is growing too fast for its own good. There are so many exciting and talented players coming up through the college level that aren't given the chance to carry that momentum into the WNBA because the league is hamstringing itself. And while it's true that a salary cap is important to maintain a competitive balance early on, it's clear that the WNBA is ready to be bust wide open. It just needs to get out of its own way and remove the salary cap. Now, this isn't without its risks. Removing the salary cap could further consolidate the best talent on top teams willing to spend the most money, effectively creating a striated league of haves and have-nots. But I think that risk is worth it, because with a hard cap on teams, owners aren't incentivized to build the best organizations. They're incentivized to stay under the cap. This has created an effect where owners aren't even encouraged to provide better payment models or accommodations for players. In fact, they're fined if they do. For example, the Las Vegas Aces, last year's WNBA champions, were subject to an investigation after it was found they were paying players under the table with the promise of brand sponsorship money. Another team in the league, the New York Liberty, was fined $500,000 last year for chartering a flight for their team. And keep in mind, all WNBA teams still fly commercial. And the league said they'd rather see players doing that rather than encourage owners to spend their own money on better transportation for their own team. This is the epitome of putting the equality of all players before the spirit of competition, just because you're afraid of the inequality that could arise within your own league. But really, for the WNBA, there is no downside, because if owners want to spend money to build better facilities, provide better transportation, or just pay their players more, let them. It's likely that it'll result in better teams, and other owners will hopefully see that and realize what they need to do to also compete, i.e. spend more money on their players. And if it doesn't work for some teams and they lose money investing more in their franchise, then the NBA can continue to cover their losses just like it has been for the last 26 years. And the women in the WNBA are better off because of it. 
Removing the salary cap could also be the pathway forward to finally allowing developmental rosters, where teams could pay players to stash them on their G League squad instead of just cutting them. And maybe not every team could afford to have a developmental roster, but that's okay, because in absolute terms, it'll create more opportunities for players even if just three or four teams do it. This is also a great opportunity for the WNBA to test different compensation models. Maybe they take a move out of the Aces playbook and allow teams to include sponsorship revenue as a share of their total compensation, or even an equity stake in the team. These are all things that could help innovate the way athletes get paid in every sport, while also helping bolster the financial model model of the WNBA now. Because if we look back in time and analyze the rise of these huge American sports leagues, we start to realize that only once leagues like the NBA took pride in ownership and in innovating their product did it start to flourish. I mean, professional sports are built on the foundation of competition, and right now the WNBA is sacrificing that competition for the sake of equality across all of its teams. But this model can't last. And the WNBA won't either unless it finally allows its teams to start taking these training wheels off.